Good morning. Uh, today we continue our series on through looking at church adjustments. Uh, for us as the body of believers, as the body of Christ, as followers of Jesus Christ, to be his witnesses to the nations, uh, there are adjustments throughout this life that we always have to continually make. And so what adjustments are we going to make? We saw three weeks ago at the adjustments that we didn't make, first to redefine and have the right definition of what it means to be a Christian. A Christian is not one who merely calls himself a Christian, but a Christian one who is a follower of Jesus Christ. And a follower of Jesus Christ is one who follows Jesus Christ. We must not call ourselves Christians, but we must follow Jesus. Secondly, what does it mean to be a believer, a Christian who is blessed by God? And we redefine that a little bit. We saw in the Gospels Jesus saying that, hey, it's harder, it's more difficult. For it's easier for a camel to enter through an eye of a needle than it is for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. Why? Because those who are rich, those who are wealthy, those who have a lot of earthly possessions, they have a lot of things that they are lacking that they will not surrender in order to follow Jesus. But so often in this world, we associate earthly treasures with being blessed by God. And so we saw there, then no wonder, it seems like a curse when we're told to surrender everything to follow Jesus. The greatest blessing of all is nothing this earth can give us, but the greatest blessing of all is to know God and to make him known. The greatest blessing that you can instill upon your children is not earthly treasures, is not an earthly inheritance, but it's to teach them about God and to equip them to share him with others. Then last week, we saw another adjustment that we need to make. How do we approach sin and sinners? How do we approach sin and sinners that requires an adjustment? And so last week we looked at Mark chapter 2, verses 13 through 17, where Jesus goes and reclines at the table with sinners. The Pharisees, they're incredulous. They can't believe that Jesus is eating with sinners, but they are correct yet incorrect. Jesus is indeed eating with sinners, however, incorrect they presume that they themselves are not sinners. In order for us to be witnesses of Jesus Christ, we must first realize that, yes, look at all those sinners in the world around us. But we must realize, look at all those sinners in the world around us. Man, they're just like me because I'm a sinner. We looked at those labels, right? Man, Las Vegas is sin city. Look at us. We're the Bible Belt. Right? However, that shift is necessary. Yes, Las Vegas is sin city. However, we here in North Dallas, we live in sin belt. Right? Every vice, every sin, every temptation that is available in Las Vegas is alive and well here. Why? Because humans, sinners are in Vegas. Humans, sinners are here. Jesus reclines at the table with sinners. The Pharisees are incredulous. They do not follow Jesus because they do not see themselves as sinners. They think they are better than. The second correction to make then there as well that we saw in the text, uh, in order to be witnesses of Jesus Christ, first to realize that we're sinners, but then secondly, to not change people. Our job as followers of Jesus Christ is not to change people, is not to transform people, but it is to point them to the one who changes and transforms. Our job is to point them to Jesus Christ and to let God, to let the Holy Spirit do the rest. So instead of waiting until that person changes and then loving them, instead of waiting for that person to change and then inviting them to church, love on them, care on them, invite them to church, invite them to community, invite them to your homes, so that they may come know the one who will transform them. And then lastly, last week, we saw that we must be very careful with sin. Jesus makes himself known. He bears witness by reclining with sinners. Jesus walks and talks with sinners. Jesus eats with sinners. Jesus loves and cares and heals sinners. But nowhere in the text does Jesus with sinners. 
The last thing we need to adjust is we make sure that we protect our witness. That yes, we love and we care for those who are in the world, but we must never compromise on our faith. We must never compromise on our witness. Today then, we're going to look at another transformation, or rather another adjustment that we need to make in order for us to be effective followers of Jesus Christ, in order for us to be effective witnesses of the gospel. So this morning, we'll see that the transformation, or rather the adjustment that we need to make, is that we need to adjust from obeying traditions and old habits, and instead to obey God's word in the scriptures. Oftentimes, tradition trumps scripture. And we'll see that that's what gets in the way of us being followers of Jesus Christ. So this morning, if you would, please turn with your Bibles to Mark chapter 2. And we'll pick up where we left off last week, starting with verse 18 and going just to verse 22. Mark chapter 2, verses 18 through 22. You can find the book of Mark in the New Testament towards the right-hand side of your Bibles, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Mark is the second book in the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. As we go through God's Word each morning, each Sunday, I encourage you to, to bring uh, a physical copy of the Bible. It's good to be able to navigate and to know within the context where you can find certain scriptures, and again as well, as we grow in knowing God's word, uh, if you need help finding a certain page, uh, please don't hesitate to ask your neighbor who's next to you, and neighbor, if you see somebody who needs help looking for a certain passage, please don't hesitate to offer a helping hand. Mark chapter 2. Mark is written by Mark. Mark is not an apostle, however, he's a close associate of the apostle Peter. Uh, We see that he travels with Peter Uh, interpreting and writing down his messages. Uh, Mark, otherwise we see him identify as John Mark throughout the book of Acts and also throughout some of the other epistles. Uh, John being his Hebrew name, Mark being his Latin name. John, or rather John Mark, here then records this, the account that's given to him. Uh, Mark is the shortest of the Gospels, and so we see this narrative move very quickly. Mark chapter 1 begins with John the Baptist preparing the way for the Lord, then the baptism of Jesus Christ, then Jesus is tempted, he begins his earthly ministry. In chapter 1, he starts calling disciples, he heals, preaches, he teaches. Chapter 2, he does more of the same. He calls more disciples, he heals, preaches, teaches, and then there we saw in chapter 13, he calls Levi, Levi follows him, he reclines at the table with Levi, with the tax collectors, with the sinners, And the religious leaders are unhappy. Continuing on, as they're reclining at table, as they're eating, and others are seeing this, we see verse 18, and we see that others are unhappy. Instead of following Jesus, they become wrapped up with tradition and are unable to follow him. This morning we'll see a problem. The problem with following tradition instead of scripture Solution and application. Let's look at 18 to see what the problem is. Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. And people came and said to him, Why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? The followers of John the Baptist, the followers and disciples of the Pharisees, they are fasting. Why are they fasting? They're being good and religious Jews. According to the Old Testament law, God required his people to fast one day out of the year. According to the Old Testament law, they were required to fast on the day of atonement, the 10th day of the seventh month. This is the day that they would make the great sacrifice that the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies to pray and to ask for forgiveness from God. And so during the day of atonement, God's people were told to fast, to not eat, to not drink anything. This was a representation of their repentance. By not taking food, by not taking water, this was symbolized that they were lacking the most important thing in their life. Because of their depravity, because of their sin, 
because of their incapability of saving themselves, they would reflect that as sinners of not eating, of not drinking, of spending that time being sorrowful and repentance. They were required to fast one day out of the year. So the Jewish lawgiver said, hey, if it is good to fast one day out of the year, how much more righteous, how much holier, how much of a better Jew would we be if we didn't just fast on the Day of Atonement, but if we fasted twice a week? And so it became Jewish tradition, Jewish custom, to not just fast on the Day of Atonement, but every Monday and Thursday, those who are most pious, they would fast as well. And so if you can imagine, whether it's a Monday or a Thursday or the Day of Atonement, they're shooting to fast 100 days out of the year. So in 13 through 17, the Pharisees have an issue that Jesus is eating with sinners. But here in verse 18, others in the crowd have an issue not just with whom Jesus is eating, but they have an issue with the very fact that Jesus and his disciples are eating. Why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? Jesus' response, and Jesus said to them, can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in that day. Oftentimes, Jesus uses this illustration, the illusion that he is the bridegroom, the groom, and he comes for his bride, his followers, the church. There, in 20, he alludes and gives foreshadowing of his rejection and of his crucifixion. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in that day. When he is crucified, when he is taken away from his people, then they will fast again. Then they will have reason to be sorrowful and mourn. But what is Jesus' reasoning for why they are not fasting? Because the bridegroom, Jesus, is with his bride, his followers. And if the bridegroom is with his bride, if you are at a wedding, you do not mourn, you do not fast. But in fact, you feast. The Jews were fasting. They got so used to fasting that they forgot why they were fasting. They got so used to fasting, they forgot why they were fasting, that they failed to realize that they could stop fasting because Jesus was there. In the Old Testament, before Jesus came, they would fast. They would not eat or drink they would not eat or drink because they were mourning, they were repenting, awaiting for that day when the Savior would come. By not eating and drinking, it represented what they did not have yet, a Savior. But then when that Savior came, what could they now do? They can now eat and drink because now they have the bread of life, Jesus. They can eat and drink because now they have living water through the Savior. They're fasting because of tradition, but then they forget why they do it, and now they're in front of Jesus. They can stop fasting. It's time to feast, but instead of feasting, Instead of following Jesus, they persecute him. They say, what's wrong with you? Why aren't you following tradition? A problem that we oftentimes face that keeps us from following Jesus is that oftentimes we follow tradition and we follow it so well that we forget why we do it in the first place. And we do it to the extent that it's so damaging that we end up following tradition instead of Jesus himself. What are the traditions that you are following instead of following 
Jesus. Growing up in Florida, right next to the water, my father would take me regularly uh, to go uh, fishing. He would fish. He would take me to go fishing. And so we would go there on the pier. It was a long pier. It was so long, it's called the long pier. And so we get to the long pier, and growing up, I wasn't allowed to eat junk food. Potato chips, cookies, and I wasn't allowed to drink soda, right? Uh, that was mainly enforced by my mother. And so going on these fishing trips, I loved going because mother stayed home and I went fishing with father. And on this big long pier, there were five vending machines, I still remember. There was a vending machine that dispensed uh, hot drinks, coffee, hot chocolate. There was another vending machine that dispensed sandwiches. There was a third vending machine that dispensed ramen. There was another vending machine that dispensed chips, for 50 cents, and there was a vending machine that dispensed soda for 25 cents. Each time we went fishing, my father would give me $5 to use, $5 to spend between getting bait and getting chips and soda. And so when we got to the pier, I would park myself. It's a long pier. I didn't want to walk that far. So I would go in a little ways, and my fa- father and my grandfather would walk to the end of the pier, big game hunting, right? So they would want to catch whales and sharks. I don't know what they were going for. So they'd go all the way down to the end. I would just park myself near the vending machines. Right? It was a really good pier. There was a lot of fish to be caught. So I soon realized that every time I put the bait on my hook, I would cast it in, I would start eating my chips, right? I would start drinking my drink. But what would happen? My line would start going. I would have to put my chips down. I would have to put my soda down. I had to reel it in. I had to touch the fish, touch the bait. My hands are dirty. I want to go back and eat my chips. So I would go wash my hands, come back, eat my chips. There have been times where I would catch the fish, uh, that wrestling the pole, I would knock over my soda, my precious soda. I soon realized the more fish I caught, the less money I had for chips and soda. So slowly over time, I came up with a plan. After a while, I started doing this. My father would give me the $5. He would go down to the end for big game hunting. I would sit down somewhere near the vending machines. I would take my fishing rod, take the hook without the bait, cast it into the water, and put it next to me. With the $5, I could spend on on chips, on soda, and I would never have to deal with the fishing rod. It didn't have bait. It wasn't going to catch anything, right? I would cast it in because there's other people fishing. I didn't want to get weird looks. I don't have to explain everything I was doing, right? I figured I could cast my empty rod into the water without any expectation of catching fish. And that way, it would not interrupt me eating my chips and drinking my soda. I was in paradise. As followers of Jesus Christ, as as fishers of men, as those who are following Jesus, bear witness to Jesus. However long you've been a follower of Jesus, it doesn't take long to realize this. However long you've been a follower of Jesus Christ, a fisher of men, you you soon come to the realization that being a fisher of men is very disruptive to you eating your chips and drinking your soda. That following Jesus is very disruptive to being a student in carving out a good GPA. You soon realize that being a fisher of men is very disruptive to climbing up the corporate ladder of being successful in the workplace. You soon realize that being a fisher of men gets in the way of raising a family, of living the American dream. That while you want to do this and tend to your traditions, how are you going to tend to your rod that's knocking over things, that's taking up your time, that's getting your hands messy? And so sadly, more often than not, this happens with me. How about you? 
we soon realize, well, man, maybe instead of putting bait on the rod, what if instead of actually going out and catching fish, what if I just throw it empty into the water and keep up appearances? No one's going to ask. No one's going to know. I'll never have to reel in the rod. And I can just keep eating my chips and drinking my soda. I can just living my life as it were. We throw our rod into the water without bait, just keeping up appearances, religious activity without any substance, when the only time out of the week that we worship God is on Sunday. We cast our rod into the water. Everybody thinks we're doing it, but then we don't worship God Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. We cast it into the water. Or maybe we tell some good stories to our children, but then there's no encouragement to follow through further to be followers of Jesus Christ. Here's some stories to know. Here's a Jesus. I hope you know his name. But do you continue to follow the world rather than him? There are traditions that we have culturally, socially, that we constantly and continually to choose over following Jesus because we soon realize that it's very disruptive to our lives to be a follower of Jesus. We're limited in our time, our energy, and our resources. And so the more time we give to being a follower of Jesus, the more time we give to loving and caring for others, the more time we give to sharing the good news of Jesus Christ, to raising up, to training, and discipling others, that means the less time we have to following our own lives. So what is the solution that we need to make? If the problem is that we oftentimes follow traditions to the point that we follow traditions instead of follow Jesus, even the religious things that we do, what do we do instead? Verse 21. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. If he does, the patch tears away from it, the new from the old, and a worse tear is made. All right. So no one tear, sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. All right. I don't sew. Uh, however, you take an old garment that's been washed. The old garment has already been shrunk. If you take that old garment and you need to patch it up, you take a new piece of cloth. You match it to the exact size of the patch. You patch it up. What happens later on after wear, after washing, after use? The patch that used to be the right size that was new will now shrink to a size that's too small and tear away from the other cloth. Jesus gives another example. 22. And no one puts new wine into old wine skins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins and the wine is destroyed and so are the skins. But new wine is for fresh wine skins. So when they would put new wine into new wine skins, the wine would grow old and ferment. And as the wine fermented, it would expand and stretch the wine skin. So once the wine skin is old, it has already been stretched to an extent. If you were to fill it up with new wine, that new wine would ferment and stretch the wine skin some more, thus breaking and bursting it. So what is Jesus talking about in reference to patches and to wineskin? What happens when you mix the old with the new? When you try and mix the old with the new, it's incompatible. It doesn't work. I think it's safe to say for us here at PCAC, we're not in danger of mixing old fabric with a new cloth. I think it's safe to say that we're not mixing old wine skin for new wine, although it's cool if you home brewery. But I think what the danger that Jesus is telling us is this. The very danger of mixing our old traditions, our old way of life, and trying to mix it with being a follower of Jesus. So his warning is that the two are incompatible. 
we cannot serve two masters. We cannot try to continue to drag in our old life, our old ways of doing things, our own old dreams and aspirations of the American dream and try and infuse it as a follower of Jesus Christ. The two won't match. Inevitably, the two will tear away. It will burst. It won't comply. We cannot try to mix the old with the new. So instead of mixing the old with the new, the solution then is this. You put the old with the old. The old way must go and die with the old. The new must begin in a new manner. As followers of Jesus Christ, what traditions, what old ways do we have? Well, how do we know? Because we are cultural people. We are social people. We are people that exist with others. How do we exist within a culture, within a context? How do we exist socially just to exist with people around us? But to take on this new wineskin, to take on this new cloth, to take on this new way of life. A good measure for our lives is this. Check and examine our lives to see in what ways do we compromise on Scripture. Then we'll know. What, based on Scripture, are we choosing to choose tradition over instead of following God's word? One thing that I can think of as a Chinese church, as someone with Asian parents, when I read scripture about how you deal with conflict and how do you make right, how do you restore and make restitution for conflict, man, I think in my life, I think about my family, we choose tradition over scripture all the time. Scripture goes and says, approach them, to confront them gently, to bring witnesses, to resolve that issue, right? To bring it up, to not brush it and sweep it under the rug. But how do we choose tradition over Scripture? Well, I look at my family, it's like, oh. approach them, talk to them direct. Well, no, I don't. We're very good at brushing it under the rug. We're very good at beating around the bush. We're really good at not wanting to pick at it because we don't want to bring it up. How do we choose tradition over God's word? How about when it comes to making disciples? Do we see where does scripture fit into our lives? Which verses do we like? Which verses do we not like? Which verses about sin do we like? We'll keep those. Which verses about sin do we not like? We'll throw those out. And so oftentimes we've created for us, ourselves a schedule. We follow tradition and then we pick and choose the scripture that fits that tradition. So solution application is then we need to switch that around. We need to choose to follow scripture and then based on scripture, choose what traditions to utilize and to keep. What would that look like then? If I told you, hey, um, can you make me some clam chowder, right? Some New England clam chowder. Um, and you went to the grocery store and you picked up uh, a foot long bread, baguette thing, and you got some meatballs and some marinara sauce, and you got some cheese, right, provolone, um, cheddar, whatever cheese you like, right? And you came back, and you started putting those ingredients together, right? What would you come up with? Hopefully you, a meatball sub, right? I don't know how you make clam chowder out of that. I'm trying to think something you couldn't be too great with, right? If I say, hey, get me clam chowder, and you went and got ingredients for a meatball sub, and you came back, and you put it together, and you made a meatball sub, and you got frustrated. Why is this not clam chowder? Why is this a meatball sub? Right. Then the next week, I'll say, okay, make me a meatball sub. So you went, and you got ingredients for clam chowder. And you came, and you put the ingredients together. And after you cooked it, you put it together, you have clam chowder, and you're so frustrated. You're like, what is this? Why can't I come up with a meatball sub? 
go and make disciples by baptizing, by going, by teaching them to obey everything that Christ has commanded. We live our lives. We gather up our ingredients. Go and make disciples. We're gathering ingredients. We're shopping around with our lives. We're accumulating skills, experiences. And when we put the ingredients together, oftentimes we get so frustrated. Why is this not a disciple-making life? Why, when it's asking for clam chowder every time I put together a meatball sub? The problem is we fail to make disciples, to be disciple makers, because we're choosing the wrong ingredients to make our lives with. Students, as you study and pursue your future, Many of you are pursuing a future that is not a future of making disciples. You're investing your youth, your years, your time being knowledgeable about the world, knowing how you are to become a disciple of the world. So no wonder when you put those ingredients together, no wonder it is not a disciple of Jesus Christ. So application this morning for the students, for the youth here this morning, encouragement is this. Make sure that you're accumulating the correct ingredients. As you go about your studies, pick and choose those that will make you an effective disciple of Jesus Christ. Right? It's necessary to be students. I'm not saying to drop out. But then, hey, if you're choosing a foreign language, how do you go about choosing that foreign language? Perhaps you can think to yourself, well, let's look at a map Let's look at what our least reached nations. I don't know if I'll be sent there, but hey, it wouldn't hurt to learn that language. If you want to learn different subjects, whether it's art, history, sciences, why not choose those that will help open doors in the future? As you choose a school to go to, as you choose a career to spend your life in, why not consider which careers will open doors for ministry? Maybe you'll do it by vocationally. Maybe you'll open doors as a tent-making opportunity. Maybe you know if you go into certain industries, you have greater access to these closed-off and least-reached peoples. Start putting your ingredients together early so that as you put your ingredients together, not wait until later to put them together, but even now at an early age, so that those ingredients will come together to become a disciple of Jesus Christ. For those who are no longer youth, who are longer in the tooth, a little bit older, what then for you, for us? Is it too late to gather the correct ingredients? Hebrews chapter 9, the author tells us that it's been appointed for man to die once and then after that face judgment. Is it too late for you? It's been appointed for man to die once and then to face judgment. There will come a day when it is too late to follow Jesus. There will be a point when, yes, it is and will be too late to repent, to surrender, and to follow him. The thing is, none of us know when that too late comes. But that too late comes at the end of this life. Then after that comes judgment. So my encouragement and my exhortation this morning is not to wait. Because there is such a thing as too late. For those who have already spent most of your life carving and paving a way of collecting ingredients, so long as you have breath to breathe, the good news is that it is not too late to gather the right ingredients. According to your traditions, according to the way of life that you already have, compare it to Scripture and to decide which ingredients you need to get rid of. Which ingredients in your life that you collected that get in the way of you cooking up, making disciples, right? Which ingredients take up time, their distraction, what passions even? Do you find there are distractions in taking you away from being a follower of Jesus Christ? Get rid of those ingredients. 
take on new ingredients. Take on those that will help you to follow Jesus instead. Time is always limited. Resources is limited. One way that you can do is this. If, say, throughout this week you find that there's two hours that you find that are distracting you from following Jesus Christ. And let's say for those two hours, you just want to carve out those two hours and say, you know, those two hours of my life, that's not an ingredient that's helping me follow Jesus. I encourage you to carve out those two hours, and you might say, hey, what do I replace it with? Young adults, Wednesday night, replace it with community, with Bible study, with fellowship, with believers. Come on out. Men, if you find that there's a couple hours in your life that is not helping you, is not helping you to follow Jesus Christ, carve those out. I encourage you, come out Thursday mornings for just a couple hours of time of fellowship, of community, of studying God's word. Start chipping away. Take those things that are distracting and remove those. Perhaps it's those things that are entertaining to you. Maybe entertainment, movies, YouTube, TV. I watch a lot of YouTube. I need to carve that out, right? What are things, ingredients that are not adding up and leading to us following Jesus Christ? How can we remove those and add it with something else? To be followers of Jesus Christ, there are many adjustments that we need to make. It's not going to happen overnight but I encourage us to make those adjustments together as a community, as fellow followers and brothers, sisters in Jesus Christ. So that we do not get caught away with following traditions for the sake of doing traditions. So we do not get caught away of doing things and forgetting why we do it. We come every first Sunday of the month and partake in Holy Communion. It can be easy for us to get caught up in doing the things that we do. Perhaps sometimes we've seen us pointing out to others and thinking, what are they doing? What are they doing not being religious, not keeping to tradition, failing to realize that they're following Jesus? And that we're not following Jesus because we're preoccupied with tradition. Even in the religious things that we do here at PCAC, even in the things that we call Bible study, even the things that we call worship service, We can become so busy, preoccupied. We can be caught up in the tradition of coming to Sunday morning worship that we can come and leave without worshiping. We can get caught up in the tradition of reading our Bibles that we can come and leave without actually studying God's word. We can come and leave being around a community of believers. But if it becomes tradition and routine, we can come and go without actually being in community with believers. And so as a reminder for us to keep grounded, Jesus gave this as a reminder for his disciples on the night that he was betrayed. The bread and the cup. The bread represents his body that was sacrificed on the cross. And his blood represents the blood that was shed. The blood that was shed to cover our sins. Scripture tells us that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. There is no forgiveness of sins. And so this is what we do, why we do, and how we do it. As we come to the Lord's table this morning, as you are ready, come and take both elements. Take the bread and the cup. Return to your seat, and we'll eat and drink together. If you are not a follower of Jesus Christ, Please do not take the bread and the cup lest you eat and drink judgment upon yourself. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, but right now your life is not reflective of that, if you are living in unrepentant sin, if you are unwilling to let go and to surrender and to repent of something that has been made light to you, I encourage you to refrain and do not take the bread and the cup that let this be an opportunity to also physically represent your relationship with God. That there's a brokenness right now, that there's a struggle that you're having. So I encourage you to remain in your seat, to continue to pray 
and to struggle through that. During this time, during Holy Communion, first reflect. Reflect on what Jesus has done in your life. That he is your Lord and Savior, that he has saved you from your sins. Take time to remember what Christ is currently doing in your life. That you have been saved and you are being saved. That each and every day you're being refined to be made more and more like Jesus Christ. And then rejoice. Look forward to the future. That we not only have the hope of salvation here and today, but also for all eternity. Take a moment to reflect, remember, and to rejoice. And as you are ready, then come forward, take the bread and the cup back to your seat, and we'll eat and drink together.